You're listening to Trinity Foundation Radio. I'm your host, Steve Matthews. Thanks for joining me for episode 29. Today, I have a special returning guest, someone I think you'll be familiar with. I have Stuart Quint, and we're going to be talking about his recent article that he published with uh, Brian Beacon. The title of that article is Pope Francis Has a Gay Problem. And Stuart, welcome to the program today. Thank you, Steve. Great to be with you. Yeah, it's great to have you here, and I look forward to uh, to our conversation here. So, um, yeah, as a returning guest, I know many listeners are probably already familiar with your work, uh, but for the benefit of those hearing you for the first time, tell me about your background and the work you do at Berean Beacon. So let me talk about Berean Beacon first, actually. So Berean Beacon was founded by Richard Bennett. He's a former Irish Catholic priest for 21 years. He actually served down in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, he also graduated from one of the leading seminaries in the Vatican City called the Angelica. And he got saved at a very at middle age. Um, and in the early 90s, he started up Green Beacon Ministry, including the website. The website, and it's, it's geared toward loving Catholics and exposing Roman Catholicism. Richard had intimate knowledge of it. He gathered together a group of us, and I'm one of them, um, all of us formally saved out of Catholicism. And so, you know, if you go to the website, it, it's, it has a lot of uh, articles, videos, audios, interviews, testimonies. We also have a section on Eastern Orthodoxy because there's a lot that's related between Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism. Um, and so, you know, I worked with Richard for, for many years researching and helping to write articles and stuff. And, you know, he passed on a few years ago. So just carrying the torch by the grace of God. Well, you're doing uh, you're doing the Lord's work. Uh, that's for sure. I always enjoy having the opportunity to to read your work and your research, and I really appreciate that. Yeah, well, may, and again, just to emphasize, it's it's not where you know some may say, "Oh, you're attacking Roman Catholics." No, we're not. We first of all, I, I was a former Roman Catholic. Richard was a former Roman Catholic. We love Roman Catholic people, but when you understand the deception and the darkness of what Roman Catholicism really is. You know, you, you, you want people to come out of it and you want your brothers and sisters in Christ to understand that this is not a Christian religion. This is something else. Well, Stuart, in your article, you referenced a declaration called Fiducia Supplicants on the Pastoral Meaning of Blessings. Why has this declaration caused such a stir in the Catholic Church? Yeah, uh, big question. And, you know, may, maybe if it, if it makes sense, just take a brief step back. Why, why would anybody care about this? So obviously, if you're Roman Catholic, you're interested because the question is, will the Vatican, will, will Pope Francis and friends um, legitimize homosexuality in the church? And what, so that's one question. Second, for people on the outside, uh, Christian, you know, biblical Christians, there's another issue, which is you'll see in this, in this article, in this topic, that there are certain strands that you will see in areas of evangelical church, or at least professing evangelical churches, Protestant churches. And the final thing is that I would also say for those who may actually be in homosexual sin, this is not to condemn you. This is actually to give you hope. But the, here's the thing, Rome is lying to you. The answer is not to go celebrate sin. The answer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to have that access to that power only through Jesus. So that that's that's the background of this article. To answer your question, why what is it? Why is it cause such a stir? So back in, in the fall, um, you had a document come out called Fiducia Supplicans, which was in response of so background. It seems like a small topic. Well, can can Roman Catholic priests bless homosexual people living in homosexual sin? Bless, not not necessarily say this is legal, but 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 bless it. And one of the things that so two years previously, you had some cardinals write a letter to Francis asking, take what is your stance on this whole issue? And at this time, the answer, and it was actually not written to Pope Francis, it was written to the former head of the dicastery. We can talk about that in, in a little bit if you want. Um, so it wasn't to Pope Francis. And the answer was, no, we we are not legitimizing homosexual sin as, as, as an alternative in the Catholic Church. Two years later, so in 2023, uh, you have a new head of the of the commission or of, of, of the doc, of, of doctrine and faith um, who happens to be Pope Francis' right-hand man, Tucho Fernandez. And so he comes out 
And and here, here's the thing. So first of all, you don't get very many of these declarations. So it's not an encyclical. It's not a papal encyclical where, where Pope Francis is the official author. However, the last time you had one of these things was twenty over 20 years ago. And that was under John Paul II. And even prior to that, you have to go back decades before you had another one of these declarations that was talking about euthanasia. So these are very rare. What is also significant is that over half the footnotes are from Pope Francis and it was done in his presence. So even though this is not encyclical, this declaration has all the fingerprints of Pope Francis over it. And I just told you his right-hand man, Fernandez, is the author of this declaration. Mm -hmm. So what is it talking about? And, and, and try to really briefly, but we'll get into some other issues as you like, but it talks about can Roman Catholic priests confer a blessing? It's revisiting the question that was posed two years ago. Can they confer a blessing? Not so much in terms of a wedding ceremony, but in terms of, of God's blessing or a sacramental, as opposed to a sacrament, on um, people living in homosexual sin, and the answer was, well, you know, we're not we're we're not going to abrogate hundreds of years of Roman Catholic doctrine about marriage of one man, one woman. However, because of pastoral considerations and the developments, quote unquote, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but the words are, are are there in the declaration that yes, you can bl bless the individuals who are living in homosexual sin, and the reason it's caused such a stir is because. Clearly, you have you have churches in Europe, in Germany, for example, that actually are blessing people living in homosexual sin. You have other churches in places like Asia and Africa and Eastern Europe that are vehemently opposed to it. And so you had, I mean, you had, a, there, there's a quote from, there's an article with a, a, a bishop from, I believe it was Nigeria, who talked about that this is sending shock, this is going to send shockwaves through the Roman Catholic system. And he actually had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with, with Pope Francis prior to the declaration coming out. So he knew this was coming. And basically the African uh, priests in the, in the aggregate are being told, ignore this. And what's interesting, after I wrote this article, you have Pope Francis come out and say, okay, it's okay for the African uh, clergy to ignore this, but as for the rest of you, get in line. Um, to give you another example out of Asia, you have Cardinal Zen, who's out of Hong Kong, saying that basically he felt that Fernandez should either resign or be or, or be fired for heresy because of this document. So as you can see, there's quite a controversy going on in Rome. And I'd also just point out, it, it's an example of Rome is not a monolith. It's not that everybody is on board with everything. This actually reveals some of the cracks that have been there for decades, but are particularly more visible now with uh, the ascension of Pope Francis over 10 years ago. It sounds like, you know, from what you say there that I guess you talked about the divisions and it sounds like, um, would it be fair to say that, that maybe the African or Asian or even Eastern European Roman Catholic bishops uh, are maybe more conservative, maybe a little bit more traditional, maybe that's the better word traditional in terms of their thinking than, um, than what uh, those in Western Europe are or the Pope? I think that's a fair characterization, but I would also emphasize when you say traditional is actually the right word because the fact is they still celebrate the mass. Every Sunday, every every mass they have, they they consider themselves putting to death Christ over and over again. Mary is still there. The sacraments, the priesthood, all that is still there. This is just about one specific issue, which is what do we do with the issue of, of, of biblical marriage versus anything else that goes that that violates the word of god and, um, i would also have, yeah, go ahead no i was just going to say you know and i think that's a great point that you made there Stuart, because you know what happens sometimes here in the west is is you know you get these news reports and they say oh this bishop from africa you know condemned the pope's stance or disagrees with the pope and and you have a lot of conservatives and especially maybe even protestants evangelicals will look at that and say oh you know there's a champion that we have uh for our cause you know for standing up against the homosexual lobby but they they don't realize that even though okay you know maybe this african bishop or this asian bishop has a more traditional stance on marriage there's still all of that other roman catholic dogma that those mm -hmm. people do teach and believe well let, let me add something else to that um it's selective so why, why is Pope Francis not going after the African clergy? Well, Africa happens to be one of the fastest growing places for 
uh, the Roman Catholic Church in terms of attendees. I mean, you have a growing population, which is becoming an increasing rarity in our world, unfortunately. Let me give you a quick contrast. Cardinal Raymond Burke from the United States, who uh, in December, I believe it was last year, was, uh, was being threatened to lose his apartment as he was being demoted from different things by Pope Francis. What was the reason? Because Cardinal Burke was criticizing Pope Francis. So they're not consistent. And to, to say to your first point about, oh, let's look, let, 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 the, let the evangelicals look for a champ, champions in the Roman Catholic Church. Don't. I, I throw in Cardinal or, um, Vigano as well, um, former nuncio of the United States from the Vatican. Uh, he, he's very much of a diehard Catholic. He, they, they all hold to a false gospel. That's the key thing to keep in mind. This is just an issue of, you know, and again, we can get into, well, there's, that's the surface issue, but there's actually deeper things going on. But the point is, is that I look at more or less like a, a, a few mafia families that are quarreling, but they're all mafia at the end of the day. Yeah, I think that's a, that's, that's a really good point, Stuart. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to cover on that particular topic, or would you like to move on to, to something else? I, I think I think look, 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 I'd like to get into some of the deeper issues of, of, of Rome. Okay. And, and, yeah. You know, tell me where you want to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, I wanted to move on to to maybe the next item you and I were going to going to talk about, and that is, you know, that fiducia supplicants you know represents a major break from Rome's past claims on on sexual morality. And and as you noted in your article, and I'm just quoting what you wrote here, this is a quote, uh, many ask how Rome could throw away such a longstanding dogma on something like homosexuality. Um, and uh, you gave three reasons um, for for this, uh, the reason that they're willing to throw this away. And uh, number one, you said, you know, there's a wavering and, and unstable source of authority vested in man, not in God's timeless holy word. Number two, a fake and corrupt priesthood. And number three, a false Catholic gospel that offers no hope. Uh, that's that's quite a bit there to talk about. So if you could, you know, <laughs> please tell me more about the, these reasons for Rome's doctrinal shift. Okay, so let, let let's break it down to nice bite sized issues. So so let's talk about first of all the standard of authority, very big deal. And and many, I'm sure many of many of us know that in contrast with with biblical Christianity, where sola scriptura, the word of God, is God breathed and is 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 useful for training, teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, righteousness, to equip thoroughly the man of God for every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, which I'm quoting, paraphrasing. Um, but Rome believes in scripture and tradition, but this is the key part, mediated by the magisterium, mediated by Rome, and here's where it gets really, it shows that, so first of all, anytime you put something equal to God, equal to his word, you immediately undermine it. And we and there's countless examples with Rome, and 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 by the way, other other cultic groups that do that, and we don't need to get into that. But, but let's let's focus on Rome. But the other thing is that, as the Magisterium tells you, so a diehard Roman Catholic would tell you and me, we have no right to interpret fiducia supplicans. We just we're just supposed to do as we're told. Which by the way is what I just told it said earlier about Pope Francis: fall into line, do what I say. The other thing that you have going on, and, and, and it's mentioned in the article, is, is um, we're seeing an, another example of what's called the development hypothesis put forth by John Cardinal Henry Newman. He lived back in the 1800s. He had been in the Church of England. He was someone who was called Anglo-Catholic. So he wanted to stay in the Church of England, but he was, he was bringing in Catholic practices, you know, incense and, you know, uh, highlighting the episcopacy, the, 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 the hierarchy of the church and all kinds of this. certainly the 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 sacramentalism the 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 sacerdotalism of Rome but put in the Church of England and eventually he came out and he became Roman Catholic and he was elevated cardinal so the the hypothesis the, the doctrine hypothesis or the hypothesis doctrine says you know so he uses the analogy of an acorn in a tree so where you find the acorn you will eventually find a tree because the acorn grows up. So meaning when you look into history, all they need to all an interpreter needs to do is to look for some little kernel that he can interpret as, oh, that justifies something we do today. Very and, and, and you see that in things like, for example, uh, papal infallibility. That if you went back to even 
But for Gregory the Seventh, go read. And, and you mentioned about having Tim Kaufman talk about uh, Pope Julius. Th these guys at that time never had any clue that they that Rome was the infallible pope, was primacy over all the other bishops and whatnot. This is a, a doctrine that's invented later, and they just read back, they eisegeted, if you will, into history in order to show, oh, see, we can justify it. How does this apply to fiducia supplicans? Well, it's very interesting. You, one of the footnotes talks about a Church of England. Um, you know, and I, if I can just go in, some of the language is actually very reflective of, of Newman's doctrine, where you see, um, hold on, let me just get in there. So basically where it talks about development. Here we go. So, so I'll just read from the, from the document just really briefly. Um, innovative contribution to the pastoral meaning of blessings, permitting a, a broadening and enrichment of the classical understanding of blessings, which is closely linked to a liturgical perspective. Such theological reflection based on the pastoral vision of Pope Francis implies a real development, and it goes on. And the words I bring out are innovative, broadening, theological reflection, real development, what does that sound like? That is exactly what Cardinal Henry Newman was talking about over a hundred years ago. Yeah, close to two hundred years ago now. Yeah, um, that's go go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, and I'll just so so the Church of England in, in a meeting about uh, in 23, it's 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 freaky because you have a you have a a, a vicar uh, who is talking about this very same subject, blessing homosexual people living homosexual sin. And he even quotes John Cardinal Henry Newman and the acorn by the tree and saying, it was there all along. We just never really paid attention to it. When in reality, they're making up new doctrine and they're contradicting what scripture teaches. That's what you see here in Fiducia Supplicans. And it's a very dangerous thing because, okay, so the doctrine, it's not in the documents. It's not something objective. You and I, guided by the Holy Spirit, can see and say, this is what it says. You know, Matthew 19, Jesus says, Marriage is one man, one woman. That's it. That's the only context for legitimate uh, sexual relationship that God has ordained. Everything else is sin. So Pope Francis now can start coming along and saying, oh, well, um, we have this innovation. And, and yes, let me just make clear. Again, he's not saying he's not legitimizing homosexuality yet. But we can bless the people within it, even though they're living in sin. And if you go, and again, that's another story, but ever since he became Pope, they're, 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 this is just part of an ongoing effort to legitimize it. And it, I, I, I think you're going to see it coming out. You may even see it come out toward the end of this year. When you but, say, when you say coming out, you mean as far as legitimizing homosexual marriage? Yes. Or, okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So there's this thing called the Synod on Synodality. And again, got to read another quote. This is again, another example of when you refuse for God to be at the center, to be at the supreme authority of your life. And his word is, is the word for us that we need to put above all things. This is where it leads you to. So let me, let me just read really quickly. Um, you know, one of the questions, so this, what is the synonymous synodality? So this is, um, think of it, it, it's kind of in the line of Vatican Council one and two. And they've actually brought in lay people. And so basically, it, it, I, I'd have to dig out the quote, but here, here's what it is. One of the one of the considerations: What do we do to um, alleviate the victimhood of people who feel excluded by the church? And and feel excluded is actually it, it, that's a little quote. And included in that are people in polygamy, so many wives, LGBTQ. That is one of the questions in the synod. And if you read some of the articles of some of the concert of the traditionalists. Um, who've reported on this synod, basically the thing that's being set up, that they have no voice there. Everything's being slanted toward, we need to, quote unquote, welcome these people. We need to celebrate them. That's why I say, I think, I think it's a matter of when, not if. So it sounds like the powers that be in Rome are, are going to rig things so they get the result they want. Yeah, and again, I come back to the mafia analogy because now the mafia is in charge of, of trying to bring this out. You know, and another thing that, um, well, well, we'll get to that later on. Let, let, let's hold off on that. But yes, but I just come back to this is an example, again, when your authority is not God's 
unchanging word, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. When you get away from that, th this, this, this is an outcome. Just depends who's in power. Do what I say. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So um, looking at the, uh, the second reason you gave there about a fake and corrupt priesthood, um, you know, so how does that relate to this uh, whole fiducia supplicants? Yeah, so um, I would start out with a quote from Richard. Uh, so you got to go back to the decades, and, and really this is centuries, right? If you look at the history of Roman Catholic Church, sexual sin within the clergy, within the hierarchy, all the way up to the papacy has been a problem. I mean, there's a quote from Oscar Wilde, the, the writer, that says basically anybody named innocent, be on guard. They're not innocent. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, um, so Richard Bennett, so talking about the the, the, the sexual scandals and, and tragic, I mean, we, we don't know the depth of it. Um, thousands of, of particularly young, young guys um, being assaulted by priests. And so Rich, and I just want to read Richard Bennett, what he wrote many years ago. He said, the true nature of the Christ of the Catholic Church is not pedophilia, but homosexuality. And I could give you a list of different Catholic authors including the head of uh, one of the largest seminaries. And I think it's in, in, in your state, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I believe you're right. Seminary. Yeah, it's up in the Cleveland area, I think. Yeah, so the former rector, he says, at issue at the beginning of the 21st century is the growing perception, one seldom contested by those who know the priesthood well, that the priesthood is or is becoming a gay profession. And that's why this is a hot, hot issue. I don't think it's so much about the people outside so much as the people inside. And you can see that from, you know, and again, you can get, it, it gets very uh, convoluted because, so come back to the priesthood for a moment. You know, you have the sense of power because you're mediating the sacraments of Christ, including the mass, right? To people who they can only get it through the priesthood, number one. Number two, because of the celibacy. Um, you shall not marry, which, by the way, is a complete violation of, of the Bible, of, of, of God's standards for elders, for deacons, right? These are family men in the main, right? And here we have the Roman Catholic Church that says, no, priests, nuns cannot marry. And that this is also something that this is part of our martyrdom, of our sacrifice for Christ. Isn't this a wonderful thing? Well, you're seeing the problems coming through. There, there are literally tens of thousands of African priests that are, that are shacking up with women in Africa, and they're still within Roman Catholicism. What does that tell you? It's untenable. Um, it's coupled with these different scandals going on. You know, we were talking earlier before, uh, there is a view that one of the reasons why there's so few, there, there's a, a deficit of priests in Italy is because back in the 50s, all the way back to the 50s, homosexuality was something that was frowned upon by society and priesthood was one way to at least go out and live it out, deal with it. Whereas now it's, it's, it's much, there's much less of a stigma. And so you don't have, you know, you, you have fewer people going into the, into the priesthood. Um, but I think that's the main thing also is that this, this is fundamentally. So, you know, there, there's a book I, we were talking about by Frederick Martel, who it happened to be on the New York times bestseller for a little bit. And, you know, he has his own agenda, his own slant. He's a Catholic, at least nominal Catholic French scholar. He works for National Public Radio, wrote a whole tome about looking at the different popes and especially look at the entourages in the Vatican based on 1,500 interviews. And what he would claim is that the higher up you go in the Vatican, excuse me, for, but, but the gayer they get. The homosexuality is even more rampant within the upper echelons of, of the Vatican. And so you have this, you know, this tension between those who want to keep it hush hush and those who are, tr are trying to let it out. He even claimed that the ones who are trying to bring it out, including those around Pope Francis, actually are less likely to be involved in homosexual sin. The ones who are covering it up are more likely, which is very strange. But when you consider the cover ups of the sexual abuse, the financial scandals, other things, I mean, you even have Pope Francis who came out in, I think it was 15 talking about there is a gay lobby within the Vatican church and it is corrupt and they need to deal with it. So again, comes back to 
a corrupt priesthood that is given unbiblical power with unbiblical um, celibacy. And you've obviously brought in uh, men who are living in immorality. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate that, Stuart. You know, one thing, this is something you and I had talked about a bit in the uh, the pre-interview, and, and I wanted to to uh, get your comment on this. This is something that uh, uh, Brother uh, Tim Kaufman said to me one time. We were messaging back and forth, and, and he made this point. I just wanted to throw this out there for you. Um, Tim said this. He said, you know, that Roman Catholicism is plagued by this by which he meant he was talking about homosexuality so roman catholicism is plagued by homosexuality because of their institutional idolatry um what would you say about that uh, i would agree with that related to idolatry is pride uh, think about you know we're talking right that that you don't have um drug addiction drug, drug addicts pride you don't have murderers pride you do have gay pride if you go to Ezekiel 36, uh, which talks about what what was the specific, one of the specific sins that God was highlighting to Ezekiel, why he destroyed Sodom, it was their pride. So yes, I would totally agree with that. Hmm. Yeah. And you'd see that, and I think you'd see that maybe not explicitly, but implicitly in, a, you know, even among Catholic authors because of the power invested in you know, the, the priesthood, the Roman Catholic priesthood. All right. Um, well, thanks for, uh, for sharing that, Stuart. So uh, moving on, the, the third reason, the third item that you gave there, you talked about a false Catholic gospel that offers no hope. So again, you know, how does, how does that tie in with, the, uh, with Rome you know, throwing away their longstanding dogma on homosexuality? So, yeah. And, 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 and I do want to talk... So let, let me start reading from the Second Vatican Council, because I think this is really important. And I'm going to read a comment by Richard Bennett, because I think it really brings it out. Second Vatican Council states, therefore, the sacred synod proclaimed the noble destiny of man and championing the godlike seed which has been sown in him. And Roman, Richard Bennett would point out, this is one of the basic concepts of pagan religions, the godlike seed in each of us. We're like little gods running around, really. And he goes on, it's, which hold that there's a spark of the divine within each human being. Rome brings such a concept to its logical conclusion and attempts to deal with sin and evil inclinations. Now, what does he mean by that? Two words, try harder. You can do it. Do it by yourself. Yeah, well, you know, come get some, get God's grace through the sacraments, but try harder. Stop sinning. And, and this is one of the most, you, you know, we could talk about homosexuality. We can talk about you know, should it aren't isn't Pope Francis being compassionate by wanting to, you know, let it come out of the proverbial closet, so to speak? The reality is that it's actually one of the cruelest things. It is the cruelest thing you can do to somebody struggling with in sin. Why? Because when you have this false gospel that says you have God and you know, you 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 are God like, you have the spark in you. Um, and we I could read from Godium at Space, which is another. Um, document out of Vatican Council too, which essentially elaborates on this idea. Try harder. You know, works, right? Listen. And, and again, sin is sin. I want to emphasize that too, right? Before God, sin is sin. So it's not that we're elevating ourselves, we're better than somebody. And I want to, you know, if you have a friend or maybe you are that person struggling with homosexual sin, we're not better than you. The only difference is the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. Rome tells you try harder. And I, I know I, I know people that they they went through a, a, a sin of try harder. Doesn't work because we are sinful flesh and the old man drags us down. The only way that we can be saved from that is putting on Jesus Christ, is turning to him in repentance and belief and asking him to save us, to give him, give us his power. We're not God. But we ask God to give us his power, to change our desires, to, to help us flee temptation. And yet Rome instead says, let's go celebrate, go live in this sin. Try harder. You know, be, be like our wonderful priesthood. And it's an empty gospel. It damns people because the wrath of God still abides on them 
And by the way, you know, people want to go, well, the gay lifestyle, the gay lifestyle is not gay. It's not happy at all. You have more suicide, you have more illness, you have more crime. It's terrible. And yet, look at the Vatican, what they're doing, because they're playing their little political games. It's all about holding on to the power. It's all about which, which lobby is going to gain the upper hand. It has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing to do with God or caring, you know, even caring about people who are, who are in sin. And it's a, it's a great tragedy. Well, amen to that. Uh, thank you uh, for those, uh, those wise and, uh, and uh, faithful words, uh, Stuart. I appreciate that. Uh, moving on here to uh, another point um, you wrote, and I'll just quote from your paper here, quote, God is judging the Roman Catholic Church and will take it down, end quote. Um, so uh, do you see the growing acceptance of homosexuality in Rome as part of God's work in, uh, in uh, judging the Roman Catholic Church? Yeah, so I do. Um, in fact, you go to Romans 1, right? And, and it, as soon as man did not give, give, give glory to God nor give him thanks, that he goes on, it goes on to say, here, here's, here's the judgment of God, the wrath of God being manifest in Paul's day. We don't have to wait for the second coming of Christ. It's in Paul's day. It's right now. Look at our society. And, and one of those key marks of God's judgment is, is sexual perversion, is, is homosexual sin. Um, I would also point out that if you look at, so two case studies very briefly, look at Ireland. As, and again, I come back to sexual abuse scandals. But the, the faith in Catholicism has collapsed. Collapsed. Um, you look at Chile, where after sexual scandals, I think the number I'd seen was trust in the Catholic Church went down from 58% in the 90s. Today, it's like 20%. So you are seeing, in, in, in a limited sense, you are seeing the judge, you're seeing empty cathedrals, you're seeing people that are disillusioned with Catholicism. You know, so there's not, by the way, Christian, that's an opportunity for us. We should be reaching out to these dear Catholic people with the gospel and saying, listen, you've been lied to. Here's the true gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what it is. It has nothing to do with the mass and sacraments and priesthood and, you know, the, this elevated, you know, Mary, which is not the Mary of the Bible. Um, so, yes, I think it is. I think it is going on to an extent and, I, and it will go on. Because God's name is honorable and he will he will not let his name be blasphemed forever. It will not be. He will lift up his name as Psalm 74 talks about. All right. And, and I'm going to reference here an article I know you and I had talked some about um, when we were in our pre-interview, but um, this is uh, an article is written by Richard Bennett. And, you know, it's called, you know, the root cause of the, uh, the Catholic sex scandal. And, and this is what, what he wrote um, a quote here, quote, in our own day, however, it appears that Christ Jesus is beginning to uh, his end time judgment upon the apostate Vatican church. There's come upon that church an evil, and, uh, and he's quoting here from uh, scripture. He says, an evil which you will not know how to charm away, <laughs> end quote. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not to say Rome doesn't have its reach. It certainly does. It's still powerful. But, um, yeah, I would totally agree with that. And obviously, he didn't know about what was happening. He, he, he knew what was happening in Ireland. He didn't know as much about Chile or some other countries, but... Yes, it's happening. You know, if, if, I, if I could just jump in with something uh, just for a minute, coming back, I think the question, okay, so that's, you know, look at Rome, look at all the, the, the turmoil they have, the trouble they've gotten themselves into. You know, so someone who's evangelical could say, well, hey, that's not us. Well, let me give you a couple examples of why this does have application, that we need to be aware of what's going on within strands of evangelical so, so one example would be what happened in the PCA. We were talking about Revoice. Revoice is essentially a group of people trying to push the homosexuality. Well, the LGBTQ agenda should be acceptable within the church. And you have different, you have two strands. You have one that would say, well, so long as we don't act on the impulses, but we can identify as such, we should be welcome into churches and into leadership, I would add. The other would say, no, you should openly welcome behavior, marriages, et cetera, and put us into leadership and be inclusive. This, so this is not unique to Rome. And the question is not, okay, is, is this 
infiltration coming. The question is, what do you do about it when it gets there or if it's already there? And again, PCA, a pretty you know, generally conservative denomination, had to deal with that. And they, they had some uh, you know, uh, conference and voted that they would, they would reject Revoice, and that was a good thing. But then you go to something like the PC USA, which, um, believe it or not, there are some people that wanted to actually bring it back a little closer to the Bible. And there's a re an ongoing resolution right now. It used to be, well, it was up to local congregations. So they would accept LGBTQ. It was up to local congregations. And leaders and members could be that. But it's up to you. Now they're saying they must be accepted if you want to be part of PCUSA. They must be accepted into leadership if you want to be of the PCUSA. So this is not just an issue to say, well, that's for the Church of England or that's for the Vatican. Look how the Vatican's messing it up. No, this 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 has an impact on I, I would even say all of us to an extent. And we need to be watchful. Yeah, and, and if it's not uh not something that's present right now, it's something that you know we could be facing, you know, regardless of what uh what church we're in. Yep. Yep. And the answer again, coming back to we have God, we have his word, we have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And rather than compromising, which is what Satan would have us do. We need to, with love and with truth, share the gospel and say the answer is not celebrating sin. The answer is being liberated from sin through Jesus Christ. That's our answer. We have the answer. Let's not give it up. Yeah, you know, I, I think back the uh, that passage, you know, where Paul writes, you know, he he talks, you know, he lists out a number of sins. He talks about homosexuality, and you know, some of you were homosexuals, some of you were sodomites. Is but such were some of you, you know, it's, it's that past tense. It's the were, yeah. And that flies in the face of, of what the, the world is telling people, you know, the world's telling people, you know, I was born this way, which is a way of saying, you know, this is who I am and I can't change. Well, you know, that's a lie. That is a satanic lie. <laughs> and we have that on the word of God. You know, the apostle Paul wrote that. You, you do. And, and, and he goes on and says, you know, the, the new identity, you were washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in Jesus Christ. Now, the same author, Paul, will also talk about that we have to fight the old man in Romans uh, chapter 7. Um, you know, I do what I don't want to do what I don't. But thanks be to God, to Jesus Christ, that he's going to save me. Right. And then and then, you know, the other thing I would say, too, is that we live in an age where identity has never been so hyped up as before right now. Everything's about identity. You know, and, and by the way, what's interesting, what you said about, oh, I was born gay. Well, first of all, there's actually, there, there are studies now that say, no, and these are, these are from, and actually it's like NPR, which is not exactly a Christian friendly organization that has an article from scientific studies. I think it was MIT actually that did it, someone at MIT that, no, there is no gay gene. Um, and, and the other thing is that now they say, well, no, you it's a lifestyle you can choose to get into and it's something you should celebrate and welcome. It's part of you. So anyway, the story keeps changing on that. It's back to, if you don't have the true gospel, you are susceptible to all kinds of false gospels. Um, but I would also come back and say that for the believer in Christ, you know, and, and whatever sin you're struggling with, we do not identify with that sin. The Bible is very clear. That's first Corinthians six that you mentioned. Um, we identify by Christ and the mission that he's given us. Love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love our neighbor as ourselves. That's our identity. Anything else is of the devil. Well, amen to that. Um, and uh, moving on here, and this is something, uh, Stuart, I know you, you touched on this uh, earlier, but I think this is also a good way to, to kind of bring things to a close here. And that is just referring back to Brian Beacon's motto. You know, this isn't about coming on here and, and just, just flaming Rome or Roman Catholics and, and this type of thing. You know, the motto of, of Brian Beacon, I always appreciated this, is loving Catholics and exposing Roman Catholicism. Richard Bennett himself, he was a priest, what, 25 years, something like that? 21, but yeah. 21, okay. So yeah, over over 20 years, over two decades, you know, he was a Roman Catholic priest. He was raised, he was brought up in that, you know, he's, he's uh, an uh, Irish, uh, Irish born Roman Catholic. Um, yeah, so he didn't hate Roman Catholics. I mean, he wanted them to have the gospel. Uh, and, and again, that's something I always really appreciated about his ministry. And it really comes through when you 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 know read his articles or you 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 see his interviews. He had a real deep um, 
you know, compassion uh, on the Roman Catholic people. Yeah. Hear the truth. Uh, yeah. I guess I just wanted to you know, ask, you know, you know, what would, would you say to Roman Catholics, you know, listening to this podcast who, uh, you know, maybe they've seen the problems that uh, in Rome that you've uh, you've expressed here today. Uh, and, uh, you know, with, with Rome's push to normalize homosexuality, but they're, you know, they're not sure what to do. What would you say to those people? Yeah. So absolutely. We, you know, R Richard's very clear about this and, and we, we totally share that vision, which is we love Roman Catholic people. We, Hey, we, we, we were Roman Catholic people. We're now Christian people. We're people of Christ and you can be that too. It's not about, oh, well, so am I, are you selling me the, you know, Protestant brand? You know, you're a Baptist, you're a Presbyterian, you're whatever. No, it's about Christ. You can look at his word. You can read what he taught. You can go to the Gospel of John. You can go to Acts. You can understand what the gospel is. What is, what, what is our main problem? Our main problem is that we have sinned against the all-holy God. And there's nothing we can do about it ourselves. The only thing that we can do is what God did when he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross once and for all, for all sins, past, present, and future. And that our, our responsibility is to go to God to plead with him for repentance, to have faith, and God will secure us. He will, he will finish the work that he begins in us. He will finish it. Not us, not, a, not, not sacraments, not a mass, not your good works, which is, you know, Isaiah says there's, Filthy rags. Um, and it's, it's actually much more graphic meaning when you read the commentaries, what that really is. I'm not going to go into it. But our works before God are, are worse than nothing, is basically what it says. Only what Jesus Christ did on the cross and our identifying through faith and turning back on our sinful lifestyles. By the way, there's two types of sinners. And it, I mean, very simplistically, right? One is the one who's obviously done open sin. We can talk homosexuality. Yes, God can forgive you of homosexual sin. But then there are others. Of, I, I came out more of this. Richard came out more out of this, which is if you go to Luke 18 about the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, the religious sinners. By the way, those are the ones who gave Jesus a more difficult time than the pagan sinners. More difficult than the Romans. It was the Pharisees. It was the people who thought, well, I'm, I'm a good person. Look at all my works. But the reality is that before God, they're disgusting because... We are lowering God to our level rather than seeking God on his terms. And so we need to turn to Christ. You pray at you pray to him, you call out to him, you read his word, you go, you know, and, and he will grant you a new heart. He will grant you the opportunity to find like-minded believers who can encourage you, who can help you, and also who can direct you toward. Listen, it's not just we say, oh, I'm saved and I get to do nothing. I can you know, live out my life as sin, do what I want. That is absolutely not, that is not Christianity. That's not the gospel. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is the, the gift of God, not by man's works, lest anyone should boast. And then it goes on to say that we will do good works as a result of, not because we're seeking salvation. We can never get, gain salvation through God, but we will to produce good fruits and some people be very visible other people be a little bit you know like the apple tree you know some apples are big some are very small but the point is it's an apple tree and the same with a christian and that's what you can have that's what we can have we can enjoy we can enjoy that blessing from god and he'll he'll change he'll change your life but can only be on his terms not on man's terms not on his document hypo hypothesis not on you know, a fake priesthood or or changing standard of authority, depending who's in power at the time. Listen, we just went through a time with COVID right now where we're seeing that many things we were told were lies. And this is very true of the Roman Catholic Church. There are so many things that, and, it's, and, and it, if you want to find it, it's there. It's time to, it's like what, 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 what John writes in Revelation about, come out of Babylon, get out. God's saying, get out of there. I don't want to condemn you with all those who hold on to false religion. Come to the true gospel. Come to Jesus. That's what it's about. 
Well, amen. That's a wonderful statement of the gospel and uh, also the uh, the mission of Berean Beacon. And uh, again, I really, uh, really appreciate uh, your time uh, here today, Stuart, and uh, the uh, the words that you've uh, you've shared with me and, and with our listeners. Uh, one thing I do want to ask you, make sure we talk about before we go here, how can people, where can people find your article, the uh, the article that we've been talking about here, you know, Pope Francis has a gay problem. Where can people find that and the other work that you've done or, or your colleagues and, you know, Richard has done, uh, where can people find yeah. it? So the, the website is Berean, B-E-R-E-A-N, Beacon, B-E-A-C-O-N dot org. Okay. And you'll find it all there. Wonderful. Okay. Well, Stuart, again, thank you so much for your time today and uh, for the, the hard work you've done and the research you've done. I, I really always uh, appreciate and look forward to your, your articles, and I hope you write again sometime soon. Thank you, Stephen, and God bless. All right. Well, thank you so much again. All right. Well, that's a, a wrap for today. So for, uh, for Tom Juditis and for everybody here at the Trinity Foundation, this is Steve Matthews. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate that. And I invite you to come back for the next episode of Trinity Foundation Radio. The Bible alone is the word of God.